Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new appointment of uh, TH LIR, a series of uh, lecture on specific uh, research topics in theoretical physics. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sabine Haribe, the speaker of today's lecture. Sabine is a PhD student at uh, University Heidelberg University and the Gold Polytechnic in Paris, under the supervision of uh, Ratzvan Gurao, Dario Benedetti, and uh, Christoph uh, Kopper. Her research interests are uh, quantum field theories, renormalization, large end theories, and non perturbative uh, phenomena. And uh, she is completing the uh, PhD and she's studying the renormalization group flow on of uh, tensor field theories and establishing uh, the, existent, the, the existence of a new kind of CFT at fixed point. Uh, these theories are, are called uh, melonic CFT. Uh, please, Sabine, the stage uh, is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Matthew, and thank you for inviting me. Um, okay, so I will try to give you an introduction to tensor models. And so my title is From Random Geometry to Melonic CFTs. So this is because tensor models were first introduced in this context of random geometry as a way to um, generalize a matrix model uh, to try to describe quantum gravity. So matrix uh, models can be used to describe quantum gravity in 2D. And the um, idea was uh, to try to generalize this to tensor to go to higher dimension. But then they were studied as proper um, quantum mechanical models and uh, quantum field theories. And in this context, uh, they give rise to a new kind of CFTs called melonic CFTs. So in this lecture, I will try to give you an overview of tensor models in both uh, those approaches. So uh, today uh, we will start, I will start by giving a review of uh, matrix models before going to tensors. So first, uh, how we obtain the allergen expansion uh, and what are the applications uh, both to random geometry and to a strongly coupled QFT. And then we will generalize this uh, to a tensor. And again, I will show you how we can derive the large expansion and the applications to a random geometry. And then uh, tomorrow for the uh, second lecture, I will go on to uh, melonic uh, CFTs. So we will do a quantum field theory. And uh, first I will um, briefly review in one dimension the SYK-like models and then finally go on to the tensor field theories and especially melonic uh, CFTs. Okay, so before starting with a matrix model, I can uh, give you here a few um, references. So about uh, matrices, you have uh, this uh, review by Enar Kimura and Ribo, which is quite uh, comprehensive and uh, self-contained. Then for tensor models, uh, first about uh, just the, the combinatorics and the random geometry uh, application, you have this series of papers by uh, Vincent Rivasso and this uh, book uh, by Hasvan Gurau. And then for application to quantum field theories and for melonic CFTs, you have here a review um, again uh, by Hasvan. And uh, the last two papers of this tensor track uh, series by Vincent Rivasso and Nicolas Delporte. And more recently, you have um, this review by uh, Dario Benedetti. Okay. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, if you have any question at some point, don't hesitate to uh, interrupt, interrupt me. So now I will uh, go on. Uh, by reviewing matrix model and uh, their large uh, expansion. So here I will start with just um, statistical models. So for the moment, it's not quantum field uh, theory. And for the matrices, we are uh, considering emission uh, matrices. And we will look at a model with the following uh, partition function. So it's matrices of size N. So we are integrating over all the emission matrices. Minus. Oh, 
We have here the trice of m square, which is the Gaussian term, and then the interacting term, trace of m4. And here I'm considering an interaction, a quartic interaction, but you can of course do something more complicated and here add, um, add more interaction term, choice of M6, etc. And here we want uh, to study expectation values. So we want to compute stuff like trace of M, some power N1, trace of M, NK. So we want to compute this kind of um, expectation values. But first to do this, we need to uh, determine a propagator. And here we have a Gaussian measure. So if I look at the theory with lambda equals zero, I can define my, define my propagator like the expectation value here. Mig MKL. So this would be my propagator. Yeah, and define as usual. So it's only the quotient term. And here, this will just be some um, Kronecker delta. So this is, um, in this theory, this is my propagator. And then if I want to uh, compute um, expression, expectation value like this, as usual uh, with uh, Feynman expansion, we will do uh, this uh, with uh, Wick's theorem to compute this, okay. But if we continue with all this uh, Kronecker delta, this is uh, gonna be very, um, ugly and very involved um, quite soon. So uh, I will introduce a graphical representation in terms of uh, ribbon graphs. So this propagator, which was just, let me write it to a uh, Kronecker delta. So delta I L delta J K. We will uh, represent this with two lines. Here, so here is the IJ and K uh, L L K. So that this means we have a line between I and L. So it means that here we have this uh, Kronecker, this identification of I with L. And we can also put some arrows here, just because we can orient those graphs since we are studying. Um, emission matrices, I will put those arrow on the graph to put some orientation. So that's the propagator. And then we have the interaction. So if you remember in the partition functional row, the interaction was N trace of M false. And this I can represent it like this. So, if I put indices here, this is M, for example, IJ, JK, KL, LI. So if I have IJ, here this is um, identified, IL, K, JK. Okay, so these are the two uh, fundamental elements of uh, the, the Feynman graph we will construct to uh, compute the expectation value, the propagator and the interaction term. So it's very similar to the usual Feynman graph you have, but because we have matrices, we have two uh, indices. So that's why we have uh, those uh, two lines and this is why it's called ribbon graph because it looks like ribbons. So once we have uh, those uh, two um, elements, we can uh, construct the Feynman graph and look at correlators. Or if I want to look just at uh, some vacuum graph, you know, the expectation value of n trends m false here, I will take this um, 
interaction term and then identify edges with a propagator. So I have, so it's the weak contraction. I have three ways to, to do it. So I can decide to identify this matrix with this one. So like this. And like this. Okay. Now I can identify those two together. So like this. Okay. And the last one. Uh, so I can identify the top one with uh, the bottom one and make like. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. Okay, so these are the three uh, possible uh, vacuum graph with just one um, interaction vertex. And now we can try to uh, compute this. So this will just be some factors of n. So first I have a first n that comes from the vertex, which is here. So this is because of the vertex. Then here you see for each propagator, I have this one over n. So here I will have one over n oh, sorry. plus one over n squared. So this is from the two propagators, two propagators. And then I will have some other factors. And what are they? They will come from the faces. So what I call faces here is some closed cycle. For example, here I have one face here. And I have a factor of n because it will give me a free sum. You see here, this line is a delta between those two indices and I close it with a propagator. So I will end it up with a delta LL, for example, which is a free sum and a factor N. So in this first graph, how many faces I have, I have this one, then I have this one, second one, and I have the big one here, the exterior one. So I have three faces. So it's mean that this graph will have an n cube. This graph is the same, so we also have an n cube. And then this graph is, you, if you try to uh, follow here, you see that you have only uh, one face. You can follow, for example, here. I go on to, to here. You see you have only one face and then I come back to my starting point. So this will be only n. So it means that this is two n squared plus one. So already at this point, you see that we have different scaling in n depending on how we did the Wicks contraction. So now we're gonna see exactly how to interpret this and why those graph have a higher scaling in n than this one. And we can see this by um, interpreting dust ribbon graph as combinatorial map. So we will go from a ribbon graph. To a combinatorial map. So how we do that. So let me just redraw. For example, this one. So a combinatorial map is just a graph, but with an orientation of the edges. So it means that here I have something like this and I mark an edge. Okay. If I drew the one that had only one face, This one. Okay. 
the combinatorial map associated would be a bit different because of this orientation of the edges. It would be something like this. Okay. So from the point of view of just regular Feynman graph, this is the same, but for combinatorial maps, these two graphs are different. And once you have these combinatorial maps, because you have an orientation of the edges, you can actually embed this on a surface. Embedded graph. Okay. And you see this one, you have no crossing. It's actually planar. So it means that I can embed it onto a surface, a surface of um, genus zero. Okay. Well, this graph, I have a crossing here. So I cannot embed it just on a surface of genus zero. I need a surface of higher genus and especially here a torus. And then I can embed my graph. So um, put a color to see a bit better here. And then I can do something like this. Okay. And now on this torus, I don't have um, crossing anymore. Okay, so what we see here is that the graph that had the highest scaling earlier can be embedded on a surface of genus zero, while the one that had um, a lower scaling in hand can be embedded only on a surface of genus one. And you can actually um, see this more precisely because here, yeah, the scaling in n, we said that we had one factor n from every vertex, from every vertex interaction. Then we had from every um, propagator here minus the edges, and we had then factor f for one, um, sorry, one factor of n for every faces. And this combination, number of vertices minus edges plus faces, this is the Euler characteristic. Exactly the Euler characteristic. And for orientable surfaces, this is equal to 2 minus 2g with G, the genus of the surface where it is embedded. And so you see here that actually the scaling in N of a graph will depend only on its, its genus. Here, this is genus. Sorry. This is the genus. Okay, and so this is what gives um, the topological expansion of matrix model, or maybe you have heard of it as the planar expansion. So if I go back to, um, uh, to my partition function from the beginning, it was Zn of lambda, dn exponential, Choice of m square plus choice of m four. So this can be written as a sum over graphs, even graphs. So this is unusual perturbative expansion with uh, symmetric factors, and n would be here to the two minus two g the genus of the graph G. And this means that because the genus here is always uh, positive, positive, we can do a large N expansion. And if I also take the logarithm to have connected, only connected graph, and that's the logarithm here would be actually a sum over G 
which are positive integers of n to minus 2g. And here's some factor lambda. And this is just the sum over, um, this is all the graph of genus g. So it's just um, here, this term for at fixed g. So graph g connected such that the genus of g equal g. And this is just a symmetry factor. Okay. And because, so here two minus two G, so it means that the graph that have the highest scaling in N are the graph with genus zero, so the planar graph. So this is dominated by planar. Okay. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay. So now that so now I showed you how we obtain uh, the large and expansion of matrix model and especially um, the leading order into planar graph. So I'm just going to give you a few a little overview of the application of this large and um, large and expansion. So first, it was uh, mainly uh, studied in this context of uh, random geometry as a way to try to do um, uh, to do quantum gravity. So how can we see this link to um, random surfaces and random geometry? It's uh, because this. A uh, ribbon graph can actually generate some uh, quadrangulation. So, how? It's because we can construct what we call a dual graph. So, inside my ribbon graph, every time I have this um, vertex interaction, I will put here vertices here inside the face and then the edges like this. So it's a tall graph. And you see that this give me a square. And if I do that for all the uh, vertex um, inside my ribbon graph, I will obtain a dual graph, which is actually a quadrangulation. And especially if you take only um, the leading order graph, which are the planar one, you will have a quadrangulation of um, of genus zero. Okay. Just mean that you have, um, you generate a space time geometry. And in the large end limits, Especially, you generate only a planar planar conjugation. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so that's a way to do a uh, range on geometry. But of course, if you want to do a uh, quantum gravity, when you have this, you want to go to a continuum, um, to a continuum limit. So for this, you can look at uh, critical, um, critical regimes. And especially you can find a lambda critical. So your lambda from the interaction um, that's, um, is a critical point uh, for the two point uh, for the two point function, and this will give you access to a sort of continuum limits. So I won't go into too many um, details uh, here. I want just to give you an overview to um, how this was used uh, first, and then people looked at uh, double scaling uh, limits. 
bubbles can emit. So both large n and lambda goes to this uh, lambda c. And when doing this, they have access to a sum over some non-trivial uh, topologies. So, yeah. And especially, they found that there was some kind of universality. So whatever the interaction you took at the beginning, was it trace of m fourth or trace of m square squared or trace of m six, etc., they always found that when they go to this uh, limit, this will uh, converge to um, a special kind of space that is called the Brownian sphere. Brownian sphere. Okay. And this is really a characteristic of this kind of uh, random geometry that uh, was then used um, to develop what we call UV uh, quantum gravity. So if you uh, study the bit um, CFT in two dimension or uh, string theory, you might have seen this uh, UV quantum gravity and this really comes uh, from uh, this um, continuous limit of matrix model going to the Brownian sphere. Just let me uh, show you a picture of this uh, Brownian sphere here that I uh, uh, took from uh, here. So this is the kind of uh, geometry that will be uh, generated uh, by these uh, matrices. And especially they have a spectral uh, dimension that is equal to two and an outer of dimension that is equal to four. So meaning we don't generate just a smooth uh, sphere, it's something that has uh, fractal uh, properties. Okay. Um, so is it okay for the random geometry applications of matrices or do you have some question? Uh, what are defined? Uh, how are defined uh, the spectral and the outdoor? Can you say yes. something? Yes. Okay. It? Yeah. Yeah. So, spectral dimension it's um, the effective dimension. I will not give the mathematical definition because they are quite technical. So, it's an effective dimension that, um, that you experience. So, if you do a diffusion process, like a Brownian diffusion process, and you let um, uh, particle uh, diffuse, you will have some uh, probability uh, distribution over time. And this is uh, the dimension that appears in this uh, diffusion process, the spectral dimension, diffusion and process. Whereas the Hausdorff dimension, it's uh, more like um, a measure of uh, fractalness. So it's a dimension that appears as uh, the scaling of the volume um, with respect to the distance. So it, usually if you have a regular, um, I don't know, a circle and you double the, the radius, you will go uh, squared for the, for the area because you are in two dimension, et cetera. And for a smooth, um, spaces like just a circle or a sphere, those two dimensions are equal and is the usual dimension you have in mind. But when you start to have non-continuous uh, or non-smooth uh, spaces and especially fractal spaces, those two dimensions can be uh, different. Okay. Thank you. I have another question actually, mm -hmm. uh, but okay, probably you have already answered to it. Uh, about this uh, Brownian sphere that you said actually if you take some um, k potential uh, potential of k interaction let's say uh, then uh, the limit that uh, you are considering converges to the Brownian sphere but uh, um, in, the, in the random surface you said that you generate quadrangulation but you start from phi a4 so if you're a five four, okay, trace of m four. But if you take trace of m cube, you get triangulation or something like that, or is uh... yes, yes. So if you start with trace of m cube, you have triangulation. 
if it's stress of m to the k it's uh, k angulations mm -hmm. but um so that's at the point of the still the discrete um the discrete process and then when you go to the constant limit no matter if you had triangulation quadrangulation or k angulation you will still converge to this point sphere so it's really a, a universal uh, limit mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the, the first main application of matrices. And then there are, of course, some other, um, some other application, uh, mainly to uh, strongly uh, coupled QFT. So why? Because we have this, um, so because of this large end limit, we have um, parameter that we can do a perturbative expansion in the one over n. So the idea is that if we can do a perturbative, cannot do a perturbative expansion in the coupling constant, if we have this uh, large n limit, maybe we can still study it. So if n could be a large uh, number of fields or symmetries, etc. And you can study it uh, non perturbatively rapidly in uh, lambda. But then it's still a bit uh, hard because you have all the panel graph, which is a big uh, family, and it's it can be very hard to, to reason. And it's also for matrices a probe uh, for um, holographic. Uh, dualities. So, uh, like a go a gauge theory with uh, Einstein gravity, and especially random matrices uh, were linked to a uh, string theory. But this application, we will see it more in the second lecture with respect to uh, tensor more than matrices. So, I won't say uh, more about this um, today. Okay. So this was the review for matrices. And now we want to go to tensor. So why would we want to go to tensor? So here I told you that people were studying this to have uh, some kind of access to uh, quantum uh, gravity. But here they were stuck to dimension two because here of this spectral dimension. And the idea was, well, if we study tensors, we have more indices. So maybe we can go to dimension three, dimension four, et cetera. So that was the first uh, motivation to start uh, studying tensor. And the first attempt uh, was with a model very similar to the, to the matrix model uh, I showed you. So with um, so free energy, like the log of the partition function, very similar to the, to the matrix model, just um, here, a Gaussian term, and then an interruption term, some n to some power to decide um, a posteriori. And then um, quartic interaction. Okay. So that was study to give you the reference in the 90s by uh, Ambion. And um, was Johnson, uh, Cross, uh, Sasaku in the 90s. Okay, and in this first attempt, they considered uh, tensors that were a fully uh, symmetric tensor. But they could not find any uh, nice uh, large N expansion. There was no equivalent of the topological expansion of the matrices I, I just showed you. And they also were not able to use any of um, matrix, matrix techniques because there is no um, well-defined notion of eigenvalues, for example, etc. So it was a big step for around uh, 20 years until uh, 2010 
where there was some uh, progress uh, with those people, Hazan Guru, Vincent Rivasso, and Valentin Bonzon, so around 2010, where they looked at model with more symmetries. So not completely symmetric tensor, but something like you went to the D. So either different tensor fields, so you put um, a flavor on the tensor, or distinguishes, distinguishing indices. Distinguish indices. So no symmetry uh, between the indices. And doing this, they were able to have some tractable combinatorics and to find a universal large N expansion. And I say universal because for any D um, equal or greater than three. So not only D equals three, but for all D above three, it is the same large N expansion. Okay, and I'm gonna present you a specific model here and uh, show you how this large expansion is obtained. Okay, so uh, the model I'm gonna present is called a complex colored uh, tensor uh, model. Okay, so why is it called? So it's complex because we have a complex tensors and then it's colored because we will distinguish the indices. So here I will do for uh, in tensor of with D indices. So A1, AD, and I have T bar, A1, and AD. And indices will really be distinguished by their position. Meaning that I can only contract an index in the first position with an index in the first position and et cetera. And so when we will uh, represent them, this tensor will be represented by here a black dot and then some uh, lines with a different color for every um, index. So either color or just a number. We can put a label on the edge, one, two, up until D. And this one I will do um, white dot to differentiate T and T bar and same one, two, Etc. D. Okay, so these are all tensor, and then we can have some invariants. And this would be much uh, richer than matrices in terms of number of invariants. Matrices you could do, I don't know, for uh, quartic, you can do trace of m force, or you can do trace of m square to the square. But here you have uh, much more um, possibilities because it's all the invariants under UN. Uh, to the D. And we will call this invariance uh, bubble um, diagrams or just bubbles. And we will uh, represent them graphically here with some contractions. So I can do an example in D equals three. Um, so I can do just a quadratic one. So I will have. Sorry, uh, three colors here. Okay. Oh, one example of a quadratic one, I could have something like this. Okay, with one, two, three. And I can have, like, I don't know, I can draw one sextic one like this. Um, for example, I can do something. Like this, one, two, three. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, vertex invariance you will have. So it's it's then the interaction you will put into uh, your, your action. Okay, so I can do this. So the partition function, uh, the log of the partition function will look like 
something integral dt exponential. So here I would put some powers of n, t minus one, uh, t bar, so a, um, t bar t plus a sum over possible bubbles, then a coupling n to some power. So this we will fix it later. And here I will denote it like this, trice over the bubble t bar t. So this notation is just the pattern of contraction. Pattern of contraction. So um, if we have this um, simple quadratic one, it's just t uh, abc, t abc, etc. This is just to denote this kind of uh, invariance. And then this, we will fix it later, fix it to have a large n expansion. Okay, so this is our ingredients. Do you have a question about those definitions? Okay, so now that we have this um, interaction uh, bubbles, we can construct the Feynman graphs. And so for the Feynman graphs, we will do pairings with propagators. Propagators, and we'll represent them by a dashed edge or color zero. So for example, if I had um, so this, this one, green, okay. and I can do a vacuum graph with this by pairing this. And this. So this is one possible um, Feynman graph. And just to connect a bit uh, with uh, matrices, this is a dual to a stranded representation. Dual to what we call stranded representation. representation. So what I mean is that instead of representing tensor and a dash edge for the propagator and the other tensor, you can represent this with uh, three lines like this. So this is d equals three again. And you see that this is really the generalization of uh, the ribbon graphs I uh, showed you earlier. And so this uh, here could be represented in a stranded representation like this. So, so this is just a bubble and then you can add the propagators and this. And this is, uh, okay, this is similar to ribbon graphs for matrices. Okay, so you can see the parallel with matrices, but we will use those colored graphs that we called uh, decolored graphs. Uh, because it would be a more um, concise way of representing them. Because you can see here that already with three indices, it's a bit big. So if you want to look at um, generic D or D equal four, et cetera, this is more involved and this is a more uh, concise way of representing them. Okay. Okay. Um... Okay, so now that we have our Feynman graphs, let's look at the scaling in N. 
So earlier we had in the ribbon, ribbon graphs that for every face we had um, uh, we had a factor n. Here it would be slightly uh, different. So let me just redraw this graph. Redraw this graph. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so here the colors mean that when I have an edge of one color, I just identify two indices. So if I put some numbers, one, two, three, means that here this edge uh, one here, this edge will only identify the first index of this tensor with the first index of this tensor. And then the propagators are a bit different. They will identify all indices. So if, for example, here I put T, A1, A2, A3, and then here T, B1, B2, B3, here T, C1, C2, C3. The uh, dash edge here will give me a delta B1, C1, B2, C2, B3, C3, but an edge of a color, a red edge, which is color three. So for example, this edge here will give me only a delta B3, C3. So these are really different edges. So color zero, it's identification of all the indices and color one, two, three, it's identification only on the indices of position one, two, three. So it means here that I won't have a free sum for every face, but only for the faces of color zero i. So you have free sum, free sum for faces of color zero i. Okay. So this means that my scaling in n. Uh, would be something n to the sum over i faces of color zero i and then i will have a minus d minus one times the number of propagator because if you remember when i gave you uh, the sorry uh, here i put some d minus one here so you have is a propagator and then i will have another factor that we will define afterwards because here i just put um alpha b so i will have minus uh sum over all the bubbles of alpha b and we will define this in a bit in order to have the larger expansion okay um okay but before defining this alpha and having the large expansion, I need to uh, define some more objects. So the first object to uh, define is a jacket. So why do I need to define this? Um, so if you remember in the matrices, we had our ribbon graph and we could map them to combinatorial maps and uh, embed this on a surface. Here yeah, I have this colored graph, but I have no uh, orientation of the edges. So I cannot, um, uh, they are not a dual to any combinatorial maps. And for now I cannot embed them on the surface. But if I take a colored graph and I add a cyclic permutation on the colors, permutation sigma on the colors, so all the colors except zero, except zero, except zero. So it's a D plus one color graph. If I do that now, I have an orientation of my edges and this will give me a combinatorial map. Is a combinatorial map and we call this a jacket and we write it J sigma. Hold jacket. And because we have a D 
uh, colors, we have a factorial D possible jackets. And now these jackets are combinatorial maps that can be embedded on a surface, on a surface. And especially we can associate to them a, um, a genus. And so this uh, leads me to uh, define so jackets and um, so they have well we have a well defined well defined notion of genus. Okay. Okay, and this leads me to define the Guro degree. So the omega of the graph will be one half, the sum over all the, per the permutation or the sum over the jackets of the genus of the jacket J sigma. So because of what I told, I just told you uh, this here will be a positive will be positive and an integer because we have an orientable surface. It's orientable because we are looking at complex models. So we have a bipartite graph, positive integer because orientable surface, orientable surface. Okay. Okay, so we have defined this. Um, it's to generalize a bit this notion of genus for a colored graph, um, for a colored graph. And there is um, another way to express that. If we look at the Euler characteristic for all the jackets, so we did this for matrices, two minus two G. So I won't uh, do the proof, but we, you can do the, the calculation. If you use this formula for every jacket, you will be able to rewrite the degree like, like this. Plus. About two, so minus faces. So here P it's a number of propagators in the graph. And this is the number of faces. Okay. And once we have this expression, you see that it's interesting because I related this degree to a number of face. And when we were looking at um, earlier at our scaling in N, we had a number of face, the propagator and some alpha. And so now I will give you a value for alpha uh, that will allow us to have this larger expansion using the degree. Okay, so let's do this. So F and B and then and D minus one plus sum over the totals. On the B, and here I will fix this N to be minus two over D minus two factorial and the degree of the bubble. And then my, um, my trace invariants. Okay. So we define our standing alpha like this. And now I will show you that when we do that, we can actually do a large an expansion. We can rewrite it like the sum n to the d minus two over factorial d minus one times the two times the degree, and then some factor that will uh, comprise all the graphs that has that have a certain degree omega. 
So let's look a bit at how we can uh, we can prove this. So we said that uh, for the scaling we had a per bubble we have this that I that I showed you uh, here. You have the t minus one. So per bubble you have d minus one minus two over factor of t minus two omega per bubble. Then you have um, minus d minus one per propagator. And you have a one and one power n per face of color zero i. So it means that uh, the scaling in n of the uh, amplitude, so the amplitude will scale like n to the power sum over i i minus sum over all the bubble d minus one bubble minus d minus one the number of propagators okay and this here this is the degree of the bubble so this is just d minus one so remember that the expression i gave you here was so here this is for a d plus one color graph and the bubble is just a d color graph so yeah this would be d minus one minus the faces of the bubble so it's faces of color ij in the bubble plus d minus one over two and the propagator in the bubble okay and so if I we inject this in this expression, here I will have the sum over the faces of color zero i. And because here I have the sum, the faces of color ij in each bubble and I sum over the bubble, I will have all the faces. So f. Okay. And um, and then if I combine here, I have the sum over all the the bubbles of the propagator in the bubbles that would give me all the propagators and I combine um, this term with this term that will give me minus d t minus one over two times the number of propagator and this is the expression we can compare this with here this this is just d uh, minus this so this is n to the d minus two or a factor of d minus one omega g okay okay so this means that the graph scale like this and we can indeed recast or a perturbative expansion as a large n uh, expansion uh, with this power. And this is indeed a large n expansion because as we define this um, uh, bureau degree as a sum over uh, genera of the jackets, it's indeed positive. And so this is indeed a large n expansion. Um, are there questions on jacket and the degree? So now we can look at the leading order. So the we said that it scales like n to the d minus uh, two or d minus one factorial omega g. So it means that the leading leading order graph of four omega of g equals zero. So here I want to do uh, the, the full proof, but there is a theorem that tells you that for G, A, 
D plus one uh, colored graph. Colored graph, we have omega of G, so the, the bureau degree of G equals zero if and only if G is melonic. So what does it mean to be uh, melonic? So I will do um, the graphical representation for D equals three. So this uh, melon graphs are all ten uh, recursively. So you have a prime melon, which is just two vertices, like this. And so if D equals three is uh, with three edges, and then you obtain a melon recursively by adding this pattern onto the edge of a melon. So for example, I can do a melon like this. Um, Can add another one here, yeah, etc. etc. So these uh, these are the melons. Okay, and we have a theorem that says that um, the Gure degree is zero if and only if the graph has uh, this form. So the, the proof is quite um, heavy combinatorics, so I will not uh, do it um, here, but just to uh, give you an, an idea on um, how this was uh, obtained. So first you have to prove that if you um, insert of, or remove this pattern into a graph, this will not change the degree. Then you can prove that if you have a faces of lengths one or three, so meaning if you have something like a tadpole in your graph or something like a triangle, so if you have stuff like this in your graph, uh, you prove that the degree is non-zero. And with those two combinatorial moves, you can then do a proof by induction and show that this is the only, uh, the only way to have a degree zero. Okay. And what's in interesting about this is that it's a subset of planar diagrams. So it was quite um, surprising because we uh, started studying objects that um, algebraically are more complicated than the matrices because we have more indices. But in the end, we found that um, in the large and limits, they are dominated by objects that are actually simpler than the planar diagrams we had uh, for matrices. It's a subset. Uh, but um, the drawback is that it's not a topological, um, topological invariant, meaning the degree is not a topological invariant. So for matrices, it was uh, kind of nice. Um, we had this topological expansion here. It's a bit more uh, complicated when we, if you want to start uh, to look at um, subleading orders, this is uh, more complicated because they are not topological invariants. Um, okay. Okay, and then again, um, when they, these models were first uh, studied and when this large expansion was first um, derived, uh, people wanted to look at random geometry application. They wanted to try and uh, generate triangulation or quadrangulation of um, now in uh, dimension three, uh, et cetera, to really uh, generalize uh, what we saw uh, with uh, the Brownian sphere for matrices. And so this was uh, done with uh, colored uh, triangulation. Uh, because if we go back to when I first uh, introduced the tensors, they had this problem when they look at fully symmetric tensors that there was no nice large and expansion um, and there was no uh, canon canonical, canonical way uh, to, um, to do like triangulation and glue. Um, uh, glue synthesis for triangulation, but with the model I just presented you, 
we have this notion of a color. We have a decolored graph. Decolored graph. So that means that when you do a triangulation, you will have a colored triangulation. Let's, let's look at D equals three and triangulations. So it means that um, um, my uh, elementary, elementary uh, objects, uh, the triangle, they will have uh, colored edges. So I have something like this. And this, the fact that we have color will give us a canonical, canonical way to glue them. We can glue them along the color edges. And if you go to D equal four, instead of triangles, you will have tetrahedron and you will be able to glue them along uh, faces of color um, IJ, for example. So that was really uh, the, the progress with this kind of model is that there was um, um, an ambiguous, um, ambiguous uh, identification, identification uh, of uh, this, what we call sub simplices. So what I mean by this, if you are in D equals three, your simplex is a triangle and the sub simplex, simplex is a line. In D equal four, the simplex is a tetrahedron and the sub simplex, simplex is a triangle and of gluing them. Okay. So that means that your Feynman graph that we just uh, looked at, they can be uh, mapped. So they are D plus one color graph. Graph, and they can give a triangulation or quadrangulation, depending on the interaction you look at, of dimension D. So that's really what's interesting because with the matrices, you were stuck at dimension two. So it's really a generalization, generalization, of the genus expansion, genus expansion of uh, matrices. And especially when the degree is zero, we generate a D sphere, but a special triangulation of it because we have this uh, melon structure. So let's look a bit more at this uh, leading order and what uh, people obtain. So we have, as I just said, a special um, triangulation of the D sphere. But actually we have a tree like Combinatorial structure. Combinatorial structure. So why do we have this? So if I go back to um, when I drew uh, the melon here, so I told you that they are obtained by inserting this pattern onto an edge. So you could look at this as a tree and um, it will be like a binary tree. Every time you can either um, insert a melon or to an edge or not. So this can be uh, represented by, uh, by a tree. So um, by a tree structure. With, yes, okay. Um, for each edge. Each edge can or cannot insert a melon. Okay, so this means that this is uh, equivalent to random uh, trees. And it's actually uh, not such interesting because um, 
uh, mathematician know that uh, random trees in the continuous limit in the continuous limit they know that this goes to a structure called branched polymers okay and why is that uh, a problem I mean, not necessarily a problem, but not so interesting because branch polymers, they have this uh, structure. And remember the definition I gave you of the spectral dimension and the Hausdorff dimension earlier. And for this um, branch polymer, the spectral dimension is uh, not an integer, it's four third. And the Hausdorff dimension is two. So actually they are both uh, below or equal to two. So it means that uh, with this continuous limit, we did not find any uh, new way to um, describe quantum gravity in dimension higher than two. So the, when people started looking at that, they wanted to, to generalize matrices and go higher to D equal two. But actually we are stuck in this universality class of branch polymer um uh, which don't doesn't have a nice um nice dimension okay. any question on this on the color triangulation and the continuous limit okay so people were a bit stuck with this, but there was still some um, uh, more study on this. Uh, so let me just uh, review a bit what was done. So there was a combinatory, combinatorial um, classification of uh, the next two leading order. So when you have omega um, greater than zero, zero uh, there were some uh, double scaling studies, so looking at a critical uh, lambda and then looking at large end limit plus lambda going to this critical. There's also um, application to a group field uh, theory. So this you can look at, I'm oh, sorry, group field theory. You can look at paper by Daniel Ritti, for example. But uh, it's still an open question uh, to go beyond those, um, beyond uh, branched uh, polymers. This is still an open question. Okay. Okay, so let me um, summarize a little bit uh, this part. Okay. So we saw that uh, tensor models were a well-defined generalization of a uh, matrix model, matrix uh, models. They had an, uh, so melonic large end limit. So which is uh, interesting because it's actually universal for any D uh, greater than three. So it's not uh, tensors that are particular with the melonic uh, limit. It's really um, D equal to that is special with the, the genus expansion. And then above uh, D equal to three, three and above, uh, then we have this uh, universality of uh, the melonic large uh, limit. Okay, but then in the continuous limit, it's um, dominated by branch polymers
and so far no new universality universality class uh, was discovered so far um, in the approach to study quantum gravity okay but that that's only when we look at this as statistical model without any um, background space-time dimension. But then we can ask, what about in um, higher dimensions? So if I put this uh, tensor on a, on a background 1D or higher D, so quantum mechanical models, or uh, QFTs, do we find something uh, interesting? And the answer is uh, yes. Okay, and that would be uh, the second part. So before I go to this, do you have any question on the on the first part? Okay. Okay, so let's start a bit with uh, the, melonic, uh, the melonic CFTs. So melonic CFTs are in higher dimension, but first look, we um, look at 1D uh, because um, this uh, first generalization was actually uh, prompted by uh, Witten that uh, noticed um, that tensor uh, can be used to describe a kind of SYK-like uh, model that has the advantage uh, to get rid of the disorder of the SYK model. And this is after that, then people started looking at field theory with that. So let me just maybe um, summarize a bit what is the SYK, uh, the SYK model, just, um, just quickly. So here you have the, reference of this uh, paper by, um, by Witten about an SYK model with tensors. Okay, so the SYK, so it's a quantum uh, mechanical uh, model of an Mayhana uh, fermions uh, strongly interacting. And so why am I talking about SYK in this lecture? It's because the, there's, they have a large end limit that is dominated by melons. And they have been studied a lot because they are linked, the SYK model is linked to uh, quantum chaos, quantum chaos and uh, near extremal black holes. But there is a drawback. Um, in the SYK uh, model is that you have to average over disorder. Okay. And then the idea of uh, Witten. Um, so maybe just let me remind you the uh, interaction term of the SYK model. It's because you have um, a coupling, so G. Let's let's do it for um, for um, quartic interaction. Something like G A one, A two, A three, S four, and then you will have your fermions phi A one, two. And this is this J that is a tensor and that has. Um, 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 sorry, that is um, a Gaussian uh, variable, sorry. 
Hello. And it's when you do the, uh, the Gaussian average about this J, you obtain something dominated uh, by melons. So you see the difference with the tensor model is that here it's your coupling that is a tensor and then you contract with uh, your fields in the SYK model. And it's because you have this disordered coupling that you need to average over. It's um, that, that's the thing you want to get, get rid of. And the idea of uh, Vitten was to uh, put the tensor structure on uh, the fermions. So it's uh, the action at this form i over 2 dt. And then here your coupling is just a scalar and then you have tensor. So here I wrote it again for d equals three, but you can do a nice way like model in like generic uh, D for the rank of the tensor. So that's the model uh, Witten studied and it's called the Guro Witten model since uh, it was adapted from the tensor model uh, developed by uh, Hasan Guro. And the interesting thing is that you have the exact same uh, critical uh, behavior um, as the SYK model, but uh, no disorder, no disorder. Okay, and it's this uh, first uh, model that really uh, prompted uh, numerous uh, studies, numerous uh, studies. And so uh, people uh, studied uh, for this model, looked at the two point function, four point function, uh, they computed the, the, the CFT data, the fixed points. They really uh, checked um, if everything was similar to the SYK model. And then uh, it was finally extended and extended uh, to uh, D dimension. D dimension. So first again with fermions, and then people started at look at, to look at a bosonic uh, model. And it's with this bosonic model that we uh, found this uh, new kind uh, of uh, CFT that are called melonic CFT. And so now I'm going to present you one particular um, model in D dimension, a bit uh, in more uh, detail. So, do you have first a question about SYK and the uh, Gurovitan model? Uh, yeah, I actually have a question about this uh, field, uh, fermionic field. Um, so in this case, are they colored tensor and what is the symmetry of this uh, object? Okay, um, yes, yeah, so in the model I wrote here, yes, it's the colored uh, tensors, just uh, it's the same model as I presented you before. So you can again uh, contract only first index with first index. But actually the first model that uh, Viten presented was a bit more uh, complicated. Um, so it was a model that was also called colored before, so it's a um, bit of confusing, but it's a model where you have a flavor on the tensor. So it was something like uh, phi, um, so you have, I don't know, A and then, no, no, let's not call it A, let's call it C, like phi uh, C1 and then A, B, C and then a phi, C2, etc. It was a model like this, where you did not have this, um, the thing where you distinguish the position of the index. This is symmetric, but you have this color here. So that was this kind of uh, model in the first, uh, in the first cure of Eton. But then people quickly uh, realized that if you do something a bit simpler, you don't have this flavor over the fermions and you distinguish the, the indices, you can also obtain the same uh, critical behavior as the SYK model. Okay.
Okay, so now I will go to higher D, not uh, dimension one, and uh, present to you a model that is called the um, CTKT uh, model. So why is it called CTKT? It's uh, Carosa uh, Tanaza, the first two names, because they did this model in uh, zero dimension, so in the same spirit as the first part of the talk, and they derived a large expansion, so it's uh, this paper. And then it was uh, generalized in 1D and then uh, higher D by uh, Klebanov and uh, Tarnopolsky, Tarnopolsky in uh, these uh, two paper, and the second one is also uh, with Chambi. Okay, so I will uh, just, I think, define the model for today and then we will probably study it tomorrow. Okay, so this CTKT model is in D equal three, so rank three uh, tensor, and we have uh, ON to the cube symmetry. So now we are not looking at fermions anymore, we are looking at bosons. So what do I mean by ON cube symmetry? Uh, is that each um, index will transform under a different representation of the ON, ON group. So if I have phi A1, A2, and A3, this will transform like B1, B2, B3, O, um, at first, yeah. A1, B1, B1, O2, A2, B2, 3, A3, B3, I, A3. 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 So it's uh, very similar to what I just presented you, except that now we don't have a UN symmetry, but we have ON symmetry and real fields. Okay, and then the action uh, they considered, so it was in D dimension, so they had integral D dx, first a free term that was one half, um, D mu phi A, B, C, phi A, B, C, plus an interaction term. And I will spend a bit more time on this interaction term. So they consider the quartic model, but here, because we have this ON cube symmetry, we have different invariants, just like the bubbles I presented you in the first part. And ON cube, we only have uh, three possible bubbles, three possible um, bubbles. And we have to put all three of them into uh, our action. So this S and we have some, yeah, some combinatorial factors and some powers. So the first one here is one we did not have in the first part because it's not a bipartite, but here, since we are looking at O and we can look at it. It's this, it's the complete graph. Okay, so this is called the tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. And here, this uh, this scaling here three half is uh, chosen to later have um, a large an expansion, and is uh, chosen in the same spirit as um, in the previous part when we uh, chose uh, to be like the degree of the bubble. It's uh, very similar. Okay, then the second interaction, this one, we had it in the complex model. Okay. 
So this one is called the pillow. Okay, and the last one will be a disconnected one. And we call it double trace. Similarly as what we will do in a matrix model when you have um, a connected one, it's a single trace because it would be like trace, just one trace of a matrix, like trace of M force will be called single trace and trace of M square to the square will be called double trace. So that's where this name uh, comes from. And here, tetrahedron drawn because if you look at it in 3D, it looks like a tetrahedron drawn and people thought that this looked like a pillow. That's where the name come from. Okay, and that is our three uh, interaction in the model. And actually we chose this because it's really uh, the only uh, three uh, ON cube um, invariant with a quartic um, with four uh, tensors. Okay. So it means here that our um, um, okay. So to link with the first part, it means that the interactions are represented by bubble uh, diagrams that are three colored graphs. We colored graphs and then the Feynman graphs. There will be four colored graphs because again we will represent propagators with uh, dash 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 edges. Like this. Okay. And we really need this uh, fold colored representation to compute um, the scaling in N. So that is needed for scaling in N. Scaling in N. And once you have, we have um, studied the scaling in N, and when we will have determined what is um, the, dom the large N expansion, the leading order graph we can uh, shrink uh, these uh, bubbles uh, to a point to a point and we will obtain a usual uh, four valence Feynman graphs Feynman graphs and this will be uh, enough uh, to compute the amplitudes, to compute the integrals. Okay. So this is really similar to the usual uh, five-four model you you know, except that now um, uh, instead of having only one coupling, we have three different couplings with uh, three different uh, interactions. And so before studying the renormalization of this model, we will first look at what is the large expansion um, and what are the graphs that's, that are the leading order. And then we will do quantum field theory only at large n with these um, uh, dominating graphs. Okay, so before I start talking about the large expansion, do you have question about the definition of this model? Okay. So for the large N expansion, it's uh, really um, similar to what I did in the in the first part, um, in the sense that uh, we still have uh, one uh, factor of n uh, per phase. Oh, sorry. 
the face of color zero i. Okay. Uh, but it's still a bit different because now we don't have bipartite graphs uh, anymore. And also we have this uh, special interaction here, this uh, tetrahedron, which is a non-melonic interaction. So wh what do I mean by this? Is that when I uh, draw the, the melon graphs earlier, they were really a uh, melonic at the level of the four colored graphs of the D plus one color graph. You see that this pillow, it's actually a, a melon. It can be a two point melon and, and I can complete it like this to be a vacuum graph, but this is a melon if you look at it like this. So the interaction itself is uh, melonic. But this tetrahedron, it's not. So it will, it will change a little bit our um, study of the larger expansion. Okay, uh, but to, um, to simplify a little bit, uh, because now we have like these three different interactions. So if I look at large N, I will have to consider all, how many of each I have. We can observe uh, that uh, pillow and double trace, pillow and double trace are actually radiative corrections uh, from the tetrahedron. So why do I what what do I mean by this? Is that if I drew if I draw, uh, so let me draw two tetrahedron like this. Okay, and then I put propagators. So I will do propagators in black. Okay, so if I have something like this, this is a four point uh, function. So this is just like a one of my four point interaction. And now let's look at the identification of colors. So if I look first at a uh, color red, you see here I go from this point to this point, and here this point to this point. Okay, then green. I start here, I go through this propagator, and then I arrive on top on the other side. And the same below, okay? And then if I look at uh, blue, here, blue, I start here, I go down the propagator and then up. It means that I have this, and again, it, if I start here, I go through the, the upper propagator and then back down. So just from the point of view of the identification of, uh, of color on this side, it means that the pillow here can be seen as kind of a four point uh, melon or a dipole rung between two tetrahedron. Okay. And I can do uh, the same uh, for the double trace. I will just uh, need uh, that will be um, two ranks. So let's do this. Okay, so if I have just uh, four tetrahedron and I put propagators like this. Okay, so this is again a four point function. Like a, like a four point interaction. And I can do the same, uh, follow the color. So for example, green, here I go like this. 
Um, here I go to this propagator up and back down, and I can do the same for blue and red. So I'll, I'll let you do it, and you see that you obtain a double choice. Okay. So why did I do that? Because if I have my my generic uh, Feynman graph with tetrahedron, pillow, and double choice. I can replace all my pillows by one rung like this and all my double choice by two rungs like this. And then I will have only tetrahedron in my graph and it will be uh, simpler to uh, determine the scaling in N and, um, and prove what the larger expansion is. Um, okay, yes. Does it mean that actually the coupling constants are not independent? Um, no. No, that just means that when you will do uh, some normalization, you will have uh, some uh, contribution in the, for example, the beta function of the pillow coming from terms like this. But they are independent. Um, they are not orthogonal. So it means that in we have three beta function for the three interaction, and you will have some contribution from the uh, tetrahedron coupling into the beta function of the pillow and the double trace, and also from the pillow into the double trace, etc. They are not orthogonal, but the coupling constants are independent. In principle, you cannot price the coupling constant of the pillow in terms of the coupling constant of the uh, first diagram, the tetrahedron. That's good. This was my. Uh, uh, no, no, because it's really red radiative correction. So yeah. this is just, you can do this uh, for the large and expansion, but not afterwards for the QFT part. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now if I have, I think I have time to just maybe to the larger expansion, not sure. Um, so once we have this, um, okay. So once we have this, we started from a graph G to maybe a graph G out with only um, tetrahedrons. Okay. And how will this uh, graph scale? It will scale just like G, but it will be N, the number of faces of color zero I. And then because I put uh, one over N to the three half into my action, I will have three halves and the number of uh, tetrahedron vertex. Okay. And then again, we will uh, define uh, jackets, but a bit differently than uh, the jackets in the first part for the complex model. Here, you can define three jackets by deleting um, one color, so color C of uh, G. And if I delete uh, one color onto those, uh, this graph, I will obtain something more like ribbon graphs. Uh, non oriotable this time because it's not bipartite, but uh, still ribbon graphs, so we can embed it on a surface. Okay, and just because it's non oriotable, instead of having the Euler characteristic equal to 2 minus 2g, it's just 2 minus 2 genus. Okay. And so for this jacket, we can use uh, the alert characteristic to say that uh, the number of faces of the jacket C is the number of edges of this jacket minus the number of vertices plus the alert characteristic, so two minus the genus. Okay. Um, and then you can use that you have uh, four valence graphs 
to say that four times the number of vertices, it's twice the number of edges. And also that each face belongs uh, to two jackets. Okay. Because if I want the face of color zero one, it will belong to the jacket where I deleted color two and to the jacket where I deleted color three. And so I won't do all the steps of the computation, but using those two points, uh, you can here sum over all the jackets and find that the number of faces color joy of G can be obtained as three of number of tetrahedron plus three minus one half sum uh, over the jacket of the genera. And again, this can be defined as uh, the degree. It's very similar to the Guro degree we defined before. It's still uh, positive, but now it's just half integral because um, our surfaces are not orientable anymore since we are not uh, bipartite anymore. But we still define it at a degree, so omega j. And we obtain again that the scaling in n will be n plus 3 minus omega with omega positive. So we have a large n expansion. Okay. And again, I won't do the, the demonstration for this, but it was in the paper by Carosa and Panaza. They showed for this slightly modified um, definition of the degree that this degree is zero if and only if uh, G is melanic. Okay. So that was the, the paper I cited uh, above by Carosa and Panaza. Okay, so here we showed that the graph with only the tetrahedrons um, can have a large an expansion dominated by melons. So melons based on tetrahedrons will look like this, but just with uh, more uh, edges. So this would be the leading order graphs. And now, if we want to go back to the to the pillow, if I do here a melon. Uh, like this here on these two tetrahedron for the pillow, I will have this, which is actually a tadpole. You see, if I shrunk this to have an unusual uh, final graph, this is a tadpole. And the same for the double trace. If I do it here, this will be like this. And this is also, if I shrunk to a point my double trace, this is a tadpole. So it means that if I go back, um, if I go back, so leading order graph, it was melons uh, in terms of uh, tetrahedral vertices. But if I go back to the original graph, back to original graph, original graph, it will be some kind of melon tadpole graph. So that means that I will have my Feynman graph will uh, look something. So let's do a two point graph. So for example, like this. And here I can have a tadpole, etc. So my Feynman graph will look like this, but here those vertices would be tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. And those vertices would be either pillow or double choice. Okay, so it's slightly different than the complex model I showed you before where we only had uh, those uh, melons. Here, the Feynman graph, once I uh, shrink uh, all my bubbles to a point, they have this expansion into uh, melon tadpoles. 
Okay, so I think it's a good point to stop and tomorrow we can do a randomization on this model. Thanks, Sabine. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, so if not, let's thanks again, uh, Sabine. And we can resume the lecture tomorrow, same time, 10.30 in the morning, and for uh, the second appointment. So see you tomorrow.